I said in an earlier video, when talking about rhythm, that you know more about it than you think you do. The same can be said about sounds. From babies, we are attuned to the different qualities of speech sounds, which is why we as children take pleasure from nursery rhymes and tongue twisters. In a phenomenon known as the Buba Kiki effect, research has shown that we consistently apply made up shape names to made up shapes according to the physical properties of the shape and the sound properties of the words. Participants were shown these two images and were asked, which of these shapes is Buba and which is Kiki? 95 to 98% chose Buba to represent the curvy shape and Kiki to represent the jagged shape. There seems to be something inherently curvy about the sound Buba and something inherently jagged about the sound Kiki. So, in a similar way, the manner in which words are articulated, i.e. the way the sounds are formed in the mouth, often reflects or echoes the meaning of the word being articulated. There seems to be a reciprocal relationship between the sounds and meanings in words. The sound enhances the meaning, and the meaning influences the way in which we perceive the sound. Take the word kick, which means to strike hard with the foot. It starts and ends with a hard, guttural k sound, and has a short, sharp i vowel sound, which suits the meaning the word is conveying. Now, Take the word mellifluous, which means musical or sweet sounding. If we look at the etymology of the word, we can see that it comes from the Latin, meaning flowing as if with honey. Looking at the consonantal sounds in the word, we can see there's an m, a l, a f, another l, and a s, which when taken together, all sound very soft, harmonious and sweet sounding. This quality of being pleasing to the ear is known as euphony. So we have another example of where the sound properties of a word share attributes with the meaning being conveyed. Now let's take a look at the way in which poets combine words with particular sounds to reinforce the literal meaning of their work. Here are the first two lines of John Keats's poem to Autumn, which is an ode in praise of the season, where he talks of the way in which autumn works in harmony with the sun to produce an abundance of ripening fruits. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun. Firstly, we're going to look at the meanings and connotations of the words in these lines. When I think of mists, I think of things being soft and fuzzy and slightly out of focus. Mellow means pleasantly smooth or soft or mature. Its original meaning in late Middle English was ripe, sweet and juicy. Fruitfulness means an abundance of fruit or fertility. A close bosom friend is a best friend in whom you confide your secrets. And maturing means ripening or bringing to a state of readiness. Now look at the sounds in these words. M, L, F and S. These are the same sounds that we find in the word mellifluous and communicate the same sweet-sounding tone, or euphony, which enhances the beauty, softness and sweetness of the moment which Keats is trying to convey. Sound patterning, or the repetition and combination of speech sounds, has been an integral part of poetry since Anglo-Saxon times. 
Before widespread literacy and the invention of the printing press, poetry belonged to the oral tradition. In order to be performed and passed down through generations, it had to be committed to memory. Alliteration, which is where initial consonant sounds are repeated in successive or closely associated words, served a functional role as a mnemonic. A key word in the second half of the line was easier to recall if you knew it had to begin with a certain letter that had already been established through alliteration in the first half of the line. Take these lines from a translation by the poet Ezra Pound of the Anglo-Saxon poem The Seafarer, where the narrator describes how cold and hungry and fed up of the water he is as he spends the night in the prow of the ship on watch. Chill its chains are, chafing sighs hew my heart round, and hunger begot mere weary mood. These days, of course, it plays less of a functional and more of an aesthetic role to create musicality, onomatopoeia, and to formally link words and ideas together to give them prominence. Percy Bysshe Shelley makes use of alliteration in the final lines of his sonnet, Ozymandias. By pairing words with identical initial sounds, he emphasises the sheer emptiness and desolation of the desert that surrounds the ruins of the pharaoh's statue. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare the lone and level sands stretch far away. Poets use other sound patterning techniques such as consonants, sibilance, dissonance, assonance and onomatopoeia, often combining them to create mood, to enhance meaning and to evoke sounds. Consonance is a bit like alliteration, except that the repetition of consonantal sounds can occur anywhere in the word. Plosive sounds such as b, p, t and d are formed in the mouth by a sudden release of air that has been blocked and are often used for unpleasant, forceful or violent images. Guttural sounds such as g and k are produced in the back of the throat and are harsh and disagreeable. Take these lines from the poem Death of a Naturalist by Seamus Heaney. Right down the dam gross-bellied frogs were cocked on sods. Their loose necks pulsed like sails. Some hopped. The slap and plop were obscene threats. Here the poet is describing his childhood revulsion at the grotesque sight of the frogs which have developed from the frog spawn he has been eagerly monitoring down at the flax dam. The meanings and connotations of the words he employs are all unpleasant. The frogs are fat. Their throats are floppy and throbbing. And the way they are hopping about makes revolting noises. These lines employ plosive b and p sounds, sibilant s sounds, guttural g and k sounds, assonant short o sounds, and onomatopoeia, to create an effect that is dissonant or harsh and jarring, which corresponds with the emotions he was feeling at the time. Sibilance is a type of consonance, except that it is restricted to the repetition of s, sh, z and j sounds, which can find themselves in any position in a word, e.g. the serpent hisses where the sweet birds sing. Sibilance creates a hissing or whispering sound, which can be pleasant or unpleasant according to the meaning and connotations of the language being used and the other sounds with which it is combined. Take the second stanza of George Gordon Byron's poem, She Walks in Beauty, 
which waxes lyrical about the flawless physical beauty of a lady whom he saw at a party. In this stanza, he is describing the perfect balance of dark and light in her hair and her complexion. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress, or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. This stanza is crammed with sibilance. Not only is it evident in every end rhyme, but it also makes an appearance internally. If we look at the meanings of the words, we can see that they all have positive connotations as he extols her beauty. The sibilance thus works in combination with assonant long A sounds to enhance the sense of harmony and perfection that Byron perceives when he looks at her. If we take a look at the first line of Wilfred Owen's First World War poem, Exposure, we also notice sibilance. Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that knive us. Here, though, if we look at the meanings of the words, we can see that they all have negative connotations associated with the extreme weather that he and his men are experiencing. Merciless means showing no mercy or pity. In other words, it is relentless. Iced means freezing cold and has perhaps been chosen over its more commonplace synonym icy because its ending is consonant with east. Then we have east winds. Winds that come from the east are particularly cold as they originate in Russia. Knive, an alternative spelling to knife, means to stab. Here, the hissing of the sibilance enhances the unpleasant conditions as it evokes the painful whistling of the icy wind. This, in combination with the consonants of the plosive t sounds at the ends of iced and east, and the preponderance of long and short i and i and e and e sounds create dissonance or an inharmonious sound. George Gordon Byron's poem, When We Two Parted, describes the poet's heartache over an illicit love affair, the end of which he has had to suffer in silence. Sibilance is also used in these lines. In secret we met, in silence I grieve. Here, however, its effect is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. It is the sound's implicit quietness, triggered by the words secret and silence which helps to conjure the confidential nature of the affair and highlights the way that he must endure his ex-mistress's faithlessness and deceit alone. Assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds, which can be short or long. In the first line of William Blake's The Tiger, we notice assonant long I sounds. Tiger, tiger, burning bright, in the forest of the night. While in the first line of John Updike's poem Play a Piano, we notice assonant short i sounds. My stick fingers click with a snicker. The effect that assonance has will very much depend upon the meaning of the words themselves and any other sound patterning which the poet uses. And this should always be your starting point. For example, repetition of long vowel sounds can give a sense of smoothness, a slowness or a lack of energy, as they do here in Wilfred Owen's poem Exposure. Slowly, our ghosts drag home. This perception is of course triggered by the words slowly and drag. In She Walks in Beauty, the smoothness of the long A sound is enhanced by the sibilance and the positive subject matter. If we return to Blake's The Tiger, which also has long vowel sounds, however, slowness and lack of energy are not a suitable interpretation. 
but why not? Let's look at the meanings and connotations first. The word tiger has connotations of ferocity and power, as does burning bright. Now let's consider the other sound patterning that's going on. In combination with the long I sounds, we also have the plosive consonants of the T and B sounds, which are quite forceful and which all help to evoke a portrait of a ferocious creature as it purposefully and powerfully stalks the forest. Dissonance is where you get a harsh or inharmonious sound which makes the words difficult to articulate. It can create a negative mood or atmosphere, as we saw in the lines from Death of a Naturalist and Exposure. Dissonance can be created in a number of ways, such as by using assonance, consonants, harsh sounding words or by changing the rhythm. These lines from John Updike's Player Piano, where he gets inside the mind of a self-playing piano, use all of these to create a very dissonant piece, which is almost a tongue twister when read aloud. My stick fingers click with a snicker and, chuckling, they knuckle the keys. Light-footed, my steel feelers flicker and pluck to these keys melodies. Along with the preponderance of guttural k sounds and l sounds, the assonant short i and u uh sounds clash with the assonant long e sounds. The resulting dissonance helps to evoke the harsh mechanical noises coming from the machine as the piano comes to life. Onomatopoeia is where the sound of the word and its literal meaning coincide e.g. crash. Seamus Heaney uses onomatopoeia, slap and plop, in Death of a Naturalist, to conjure the sound of the slimy frogs hopping. Alfred Noyes also makes use of onomatopoeia in his poem The High Women, to evoke the sound of the approaching horse's hooves in order to create tension. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard, he tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. Clot, 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 clot. Had they heard it? The horse hooves ringing clear. Clot, 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 clot. In the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? If you notice, noise makes use of nonsense words as well as recognisable words here to create onomatopoeia. Taken to the extreme, you have sound poetry, such as that produced by the poet Edwin Morgan. Look at his poem, The Loch Ness Monster's Song, which is onomatopoeia in its purest form. I'm not going to attempt to read it. If you want to hear the poet himself reading it far more competently and with far greater panache than I ever could, it is available on the Poetry Archive website at the following address. As you can see, though, the poem is entirely made up of sounds and not words, which the poet uses to communicate a narrative, which he explains here in his own words. I imagine the creature coming to the surface of the water, looking round at the world, expressing his or her views, and sinking back into the loch at the end. I wanted to have a mixture of the bubbling, gurgling, plopping sounds of water, and the deep, gruff, throaty sounds that a large aquatic monster might be expected to make. When writers exploit the sound qualities of words effectively to enhance their writing, this should only register with a reader at a subliminal level, i.e. we're aware of it, but we're not aware that we're aware of it, if that makes any sense. Where the difficulty comes for the student of language in general, and poetry in particular, is the bringing of these techniques to a conscious level, and then putting their effect into words. These are the third and fourth lines from Wilfred Owen's First World War sonnet, Anthem for Doomed Youth, which employs very dense and sophisticated patterning to create a soundscape masterpiece. 
much of which works at a subliminal level. In these lines, Owen is lamenting the fact that the only funeral prayers or orisons that the men dying on the battlefield get are the sounds of the gunfire. Only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. Let's look first at the meanings of the words in these lines. Stuttering. This is a way of talking with continued repetition of sounds. If you notice, the word itself repeats a t sound. A rattle is a rapid succession of short, sharp knocking sounds, while patter is a repeated light tapping sound. Now let's take a look at how the repetition of sounds in the words Owen chooses helps to enhance his meaning. The first thing we notice is the alliteration of rifle's rapid rattle, which is echoed later in the next line with the consonant r in orisons. Then we can pick out the consonants of the t sounds in stuttering, rattle and patter. The assonance of the uh sounds in stuttering and patter and the short a uh sounds in rapid rattle can patter. These repeated r r r t t t a a a and a a a sounds come together to evoke the incessant repetitive sounds of the weapons being discharged that Owen describes. Not only is the effect onomatopoeic, but it is also dissonant, which helps to conjure the cacophony and chaos of the battlefield. In summary, start with the meanings of the words. This will help you bring the way in which you perceive the sounds into your conscious awareness. Listen as well as look. Identical sounds can be formed by different letter combinations, especially vowel sounds. Listen for combinations of sounds. As we have seen from the examples, poets can use a number of different techniques to achieve their effects. Listen. Are the words difficult or easy to articulate? Is there euphony or dissonance? Most importantly, any analysis of sounds you make should always reflect back on meaning. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.